program you are about to see concerns the mysterious deaths and mutilations of animals in the United States and other parts of the world. Due to the graphic nature of some scenes, parental guidance for children is advised. Severe thunderstorm shook the night skies in northeastern Alabama on Sunday, February 21, 1993. Yet despite the violent weather, police in the small farm community of Fife, Alabama, received calls from residents who reported seeing helicopters or unidentified bright lights hovering and moving. Local airports said no one had filed flight plans. I was there to talk with eyewitnesses and police about the unidentified light reports and the largest number of animal mutilations in the region's history. During the February thunderstorm, my video crew and I traveled with Fife, Alabama police officer Ted Oliphant, who had investigated several of the mutilations. The precision of the surgery that's been formed on, performed on these animals and the lack of evidence that we've got is disturbing and eerie. Go ahead, Thomas. You familiar where Mount Tabor Church is at? Down there towards uh, Geraldine Gilbert's Crossroads? 10-4. Yeah, airport is object the sky down there. Mr. Bale, call it in. 10-4, I'll be 84. 10-4. Well, looks like you're here about the right time. We got a UFO report over Mount Tabor Church. Howdy, you the one to call? Yes. How many minutes have you been seeing this? Uh, about a week ago. We this call turned out to be a false alarm. Mm -hmm. The young man had been watching the planet Venus appear and disappear in the thunderclouds. But he, like so many others, had seen other strange moving lights in the nights before. Residents were nervous about both the lights and cattle and goats found with bizarre bloodless cuts and no tracks or other evidence. Yeah, well, I'd, ha I'd rather have you call us than not call us. If you see any helicopters or anything like that, give us yeah, a holler. Yeah. Anything that don't look right. I don't know if there's a relationship between the UFOs that people are seeing up here and what's happening to these cattle or not. Uh, we've got the same thing happening up here. We've got people reporting UFOs and we've got people reporting mutilated cattle. And we've got people reporting helicopters. That same night, around 7 to 9 p.m., a few miles to the west in Cedar Bluff, Alabama, a family who lives in a remote wooded area videotaped several unusual moving objects above a lake near their home. It's moving. It moved away. Pat Beard and her son James watched and videotaped for nearly two hours. It's leaving. No. At one point, the large white object disappeared, and the dark sky filled with mysterious flashes of light. God. It's just jumping everywhere. I'm getting it good now, James. Then the large white light returned. Almost immediately, two other objects appeared to the left, and the bottom light seemed to dim and brighten several times. A fourth object suddenly moved between the other three. As it passed below the bright white light, the camera panned and there were two more objects. Then the big white light moved toward them. What I actually thought, it looked like something you would see in Star Wars something that was attacking something. Something was obviously either checking this big object out. Well, through the binoculars, it looked sort of like, it looked sort of like a star, 
but then it got started moving around and got bright and it had this red light that sort of red and green blue light that sort of circled it and we never heard a sound of any kind and if there's ever a plane that flies over our house we can definitely hear the sound there was no sound how would you characterize those lights moving around with that big light well it, i ain't never seen nothing like that before it just amazed me and before the the large object actually left we watched it it actually went off to the right a considerable amount of distance and then it turned a, a reddish orange color and was gone. A red and green lighted object was also seen by Sue Johnson in Fort Payne on January 28th near her home. I came to the window and I looked out and instead of looking straight up I just looked down like this because I could see that there was something at this level instead of up at that level. Right. Okay and I'm seeing it between these two trees and it's coming at this angle. All right, now I can see a house down there. Where was it in relationship to that house? Okay, it was coming, the direction that it was coming, it was coming from the back end of that house headed this way. I knew I was seeing some lights here and here at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, then when it comes and it starts turning, then I'm realizing there are more lights on it because then they're going that way on it. Right, and that's what this looks like. Right, and that's this side of it that I'm seeing now. It just blew me away what I was seeing because I know, but I do know that it was not an airplane and I do know that it was not a helicopter. A similar drawing was made by Reverend Roger Watkins, a Baptist minister living between Geraldine and Crossville, Alabama. He and his son watched and heard a huge disc hover outside their bedroom windows about the middle of January. Just multicolors. And they encircled from where I was looking. It sounded almost like a, a freight train that was coming into the house. The house began to shake, and um, it, it startled both of us. I got up from the bed, went to the window, looked out across my pasture, uh, and about probably 30, 40 feet from uh, the house uh, in the pasture field was an object, and it was hovering on the ground, almost touching the ground. In fact, I was frightened that it had tore up the fence around my house and it was more like a woo, 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 woo sound. In fact, uh, it, it, it shook the house. To give you an idea of how much the house was shaking, uh, the next morning when we got up, the fish bowls, two of them was emptied of water, and the fish had been splattered out or uh, jolted out of the uh, containers and were laying dead on the coffee table. Uh, on the same night, uh, we had a little cocker spaniel that uh, the family loved greatly. It came up missing. We haven't seen that dog since. Animals, especially cattle, were the target of something in northeastern Alabama in early 1993. Whatever it was could sound like a roaring helicopter or be completely silent. Tommy Cole, chief of detectives in the Albertville Police Department in Marshall County, had his own experience with a loud, vibrating roar over his house in Barn. His wife, Jean, was with him. And the house just went to vibrate, and just, you know. And I, the first thing that came in my mind, Tommy had hit something, so I come running out the door. And just as I come out the door, I, kn I knew that it was overhead. And so I looked up, and that's when I saw something that was making this huge noise. I heard a loud uh, sound, a shrill sound, and I flipped the lights off in the barn. It was the first thing I did. And uh, and I listened more closely, and I, I came out the front of the door and came through this gate and up to this gate here. And by the time I got here, I met my wife coming from the house, and we met right here at this gate. But we didn't know what it was, and we just stood there for a few minutes and looked at it, but we didn't see any lights on it. It was just a... Another day in January, Gene Cole was shocked to see an enormous aircraft right outside their house. It was just huge. It was bigger than, to me, it was bigger than the military helicopters that fly over from Fort McClellan. You know, it had the four seats in it with four men in it. And the back of it was uh, unusually big. You know, usually the tail of it is longer, but this one didn't seem to have that long of a tail on it like most helicopters do. In other words, it was more of 
like a rectangle or an oval? Oval shape. It was an mm -hmm. oval shape, and it seemed to have a smaller tail section. Mm -hmm. And what was the color of this oval? Most of it uh, was white, except it had a blue uh, stripe on it close to the bottom. And where that tree is right there behind you right now, when you look up there, mm -hmm. where would that helicopter have been when you could see those four men? Okay, when I could see it was between the pine tree and the big tree here. I come on out in the yard and that's, you know, and that's when I got the, the best look of the helicopter was between the two trees. Now, would they have been down below those branches or above? Below. So they were actually where the truck is now, sort of, that low? Mm -hmm. Just above the truck there. So that wouldn't have been 15 or 20 feet above you out there at the step. That would have been real. Not really. And as it went on, though, it got a little higher as it went on. Because I stood and watched it till it went completely out of sight because I had never seen anything like it and I was so amazed with it. Has anybody tried to track down whether blue and white helicopters are a paint job that goes to any agency? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have. And most of the TVA helicopters are blue and white. Tennessee Valley but, Authority. Tennessee Valley Authority, but well marked. Uh, they say that they have uh, their choppers well marked in big letters where everybody can know that it's TVA choppers. And I have seen TVA choppers flying this particular fly, uh, power line on many occasions. So what you've got is a paint that is like the TVA helicopters, but no markings whatsoever. That's correct. There are no markings that anybody's been able to get. And one could speculate that whoever is involved with these choppers would assume that people in this area were used to seeing the blue and white helicopters and may not question another blue and white helicopter. That's my theory. That's very likely. Two days after Jean Cole saw the huge blue and white helicopter, her husband found one of his own healthy steers dead with pure white tissue hanging from its belly and rectum. A local veterinarian examined the animal. There was nothing that showed up. He could not give me the cause of death. No cause of death. Did he examine any of the excision tissue? Yes, he did. And what did he say? He could not determine uh, as to what cut it, except with a sharp instrument. He did confirm it was a sharp instrument. Right. Pathology studies of the animal excisions have confirmed the tissue in some animals have been cut with a sharp instrument, and in others, the tissue has been cut with high heat. The patterns of the cuts and tissues taken have been similar from animal to animal and worldwide. Often, one ear is taken, one eye is removed, along with a circular excision of flesh around the empty eye socket. The tongue is removed from deep within the throat. Udders are removed bloodlessly and often only hide deep. Or only the teats are removed in clean, dry holes or cut off at the surface of the udder. In males, the genitals are excised in a bloodless oval. The rectum is cored out in most of the animals and sometimes the tail is also removed in a smooth cut through the tailbone. In a few cases, skull bone has been smoothly excised without evidence of bone saw marks. Veterinarians have also discovered internal organs surgically removed, such as the trachea and esophagus in this Nebraska cow. Other reported missing internal organs have included the heart, lungs, bladder, uterus, vagina, and penis. Stories about strange animal deaths began in the 1960s. In September 1967, the story went worldwide when an Appaloosa mare in the San Luis Valley of Southern Colorado was found dead and stripped of flesh from the neck up. All the internal chest organs had been surgically removed, and under a microscope, the hemoglobin was cooked, implying high heat had been used to cut the tissue. Strange lights had been seen then also, and residents wondered if UFOs had something to do with the horse's unusual death. Since the 1970s, thousands of animals ranging from cows and horses to birds, wild game, and every kind of domestic animal have been found with odd bloodless excisions of tissue around the world. Some of the mutilation cuts are serrated with a darkened edge like this one found on a steer in Oregon in 1990. 
This notched edge is similar to one from a 1975 mutilation in Montana. No pathology study was done back then, but in 1990, the Oregon State Diagnostic Laboratory concluded the notched edge does exhibit a heat-induced incision. It is not possible to tell whether this lesion was caused by a laser. Pathology studies also confirmed that this serrated edge was cut with high heat. This is 1993 tissue from a male calf found in Crossville, Alabama, and examined by Fife, Alabama police officer Ted Oliphant. You can see the stepped and notched incision, almost like stairs with notches on them along the edge of this wound. Clearly this could not have been done by coyotes. And I'll turn the tissue sample around so you can get another look at it. You can clearly see the stepped, notched incision on this tissue. But the world is Another serrated edge was found on a cow's belly where the milk sack had been cut away at the Margaret Polk Farm in Geraldine, Alabama. And it was just like somebody just sliced it off, but yet it was like a cookie cutter cut around the edges of it, and there were no blood. It was like they were sealed. The edges were sealed. No blood. No blood. And it was in an oval shape. And we have in this book an excision that was in Montana in 1975, a kind of serrated edge. Can you compare this one to what you saw? This was around her sack, where her sack was. Her sack was cut off in this form. Um, it was not as sharp here. It was more rounding, but it was a real uniform cut, like a cookie cutter cut. All, all of it was real uniform. Just like this? Yes. By the spring of 1993, more than 30 cattle and goats had been reported dead and mutilated in Marshall and DeKalb counties in northeastern Alabama. But the prevailing attitude of law enforcement was, there are no mutilations, only predator attacks. However, Officer Ted Oliphant at the Fife, Alabama Police Department did not agree with the predator theory. I was out in a place called Crossville, Alabama, and a farmer had found this animal with large wounds around its shoulder and back quarter. He called three police officers just to come and take a look. He thought it was suspicious. Three police officers looked at it. They said they thought a coyote had done it. They didn't take a report and they left the scene. Well, I got there about five minutes after those investigators got there and left. And I looked at this animal and on the back right quarter, I find very clean precision cuts. It's very straight. Right. And then I look inside the body cavity of the animal and I find trachea and esophagus missing, about 10 inch section of it and it's been cut clean and evenly, almost like if you'd taken scissors and snipped it on either side. So I looked at the animal a little bit further and I said to the guy, I said, I don't think your animal's been killed by a predator. I think you should have a vet come out and take a look at this animal. And he did, and the vet showed up the next morning and said the animal had definitely not been killed by a predator. And which veterinarian was that? And that was Dr. Creel out of Marshall County. Veterinarian Mike Creel has helped Alabama farmers for over 20 years. He is very familiar with what predators do to cows, and he knew predators had not killed the Crossville calf. Well, generally, when predators attack a calf that age, they go for the rear quarters and the nose. You usually find a lot of tooth marks around the hocks and around the nose of the calf, and that wasn't the case in this situation. If you were examining the cut line, could you uh, confirm that it was done with some kind of a sharp instrument? No, I couldn't. It was probably dead for five or six days by the time that I saw it. Just give me some kind of feeling about how unnatural or natural the lack of blood in these excisions might be. When I have seen animals that have been killed by dogs or other predators, there has been quite a bit of blood. That's because the animal has been disabled and the heart is still pumping, and you have open arteries and veins, and so you have blood everywhere, especially in snow-covered ground. I've seen that before, and it's, it's very bad. But if the animal were killed, and then someone would come back later and remove these parts, then I would, wouldn't think that you would see that much blood unless they hit a major vessel. If you were shown that at least uh, 20 or 30 animals in the United States in Canada had excisions like we found in Alabama and a pathologist showed that the hemoglobin had been cooked. What would your reaction be to that fact? Hopefully it's some new procedure, some new instrument, especially something that's done in the field. 
Uh, what would be the occasion when you would have access to a laser instrument or something that was hot? I wouldn't. I don't have anything like that in my practice dealing with cattle. We have electrocautery units for small animals for surgical procedures, but you're dealing with mucous membranes and open tissue. Certainly nothing that I would have in my clinic would cut through the, the height of a cow. Absolutely nothing? Not that I know of, other than a post-mortem knife for a scalpel. But something hot, I don't have anything like that. The same week the calf was examined by Dr. Creel in Crossville, Alabama, State Trooper Ron Ogletree investigated more unidentified lights in Fort Payne. The people that are calling in at night are hearing a noise. Some describe the noise as a distinct uh, sound that chopper blades make when it's uh, breaking the air. They have whoop, whoop, whoop sounds. Uh, other people just describe, uh, as one lady said, uh, similar to a diesel truck and it, uh, she never looked out, she was terrified. It was vibrating and shaking her trailer. So uh, you have a combination of both, people that are sure of what they're seeing and people that hear things at night and see lights at night and are not certain of what they're seeing. The Hubert Twilley family in Fort Payne watched strange objects move above their house on January 30th, 1993, two nights after Sue Johnson saw the red and green flashing lights at her fence. How high were these lights that came over from west to east? Well, they, they were pretty high, two of them would. They didn't wasn't all that high, I mean. I mean Just uh, above the power lines there, yeah. right right above well, the top of those uh, bone, lines, bone right. lines and above those two trees over there is where we first saw it. I think yeah. somewhere around 600 feet. That's what I'm guessing. You never heard anything no. No. from any of the lights? Heard nothing. Well, our dogs seemed to be uh, upset because of the light behind the trailer. They uh, they were uneasy all night. They they were upset. They barked all night. What, the white light in the backyard that had your dogs are upset. What was it doing when you saw it? Well, it was just kind of hovering across the field, but the whole field was lit up. You could see all the way, all the way back down through the pasture. But you could see it move. Move. And then you come know, back just barely. Which, which helped it moving? Was it moving uh, in that same area? or was Not it... at all times. Because I saw it go in behind riding his trailer. Uh, it hid okay. from view and Damn. then it come back out. That's awful close. In addition to the single moving bright light, the Twilly family also watched a large triangular formation of red and white lights move silently above their house. Up in the air flying in just about in that manner. Right there is about the way they came up. The Twillies and Sue Johnson live in Fort Payne, east of Fife, Alabama. The moving lights videotaped by Pat and James Beard were in Cedar Bluff. Police detective Tommy Cole and his wife Jean live near Albertville, and Reverend Roger Watkins lived between Geraldine and Crossville. Fife, Alabama and the surrounding farm communities had been the center of so much UFO activity in 1989 that international tourists came to watch the skies. In 1989, there were people from all over the world coming to Fife, Alabama to see uh, a UFO. They were curious. Uh, there was a little fear, but it subsided for most people uh, almost as quickly as it came. 1993, we're finding anger especially from the farmers who have had cattle mutilated. There's, the fear is still not there in uh, great amounts. There is a small amount of fear involved, but it's mostly anger. of January 1993, the same time that Sue Johnson and the Twilly family encountered lights near their homes, this black Angus cow was found dead in Dawson, Alabama. Its tongue, rectum, and vagina had been removed, and its right jaw had been stripped of all flesh. Fife police officer Ted Oliphant found a substance similar to putty on the right rib cage and on the ground near the cow's head which he collected and had analyzed. Under an electron microscope, the substance appeared as triangular-shaped flakes. 
Analysis of its composition indicated aluminum, silicon, titanium, and oxygen. It was not a naturally occurring substance, and the question remains. What manufactured product containing titanium would be found on the ribs of a mutilated cow? Similar putty-like substances have also been found on other mutilated animals. Like this young heifer in Sterling, Colorado, discovered dead on October 10, 1978, with a putty-like substance laid in two parallel lines on her back. The cow also had a typical pattern of excisions. Her lower jaw had been stripped of all flesh, two of her four teats had been cleanly removed, and the rectal and vaginal tracts had been cored out. That typical pattern of excisions has been repeated over the decades since the 1960s. And occasionally, there are even stranger anomalies, like this pregnant cow found in Arab, Alabama on February 4, 1993. Her udder had been removed, and the head of her unborn calf was partially outside the birth canal. The calf's left ear and left eye had been cut out, and a circle of flesh excised from around the empty eye socket. Unfortunately, no medical examination was performed, nor were tissue samples collected from either the calf nor the bloodless hole where the udder had been. The Alabama case reminded me of other pregnant cows found near Hope, Arkansas in March 1989. Something cut open this pregnant cow, allowing the unborn calf still in the placenta to slide out onto the ground. A local newspaper photographer who took this picture said, there was no blood or fluid on the ground or on the body of the cow or calf, and the placenta was completely dry. This photograph shows the large, bloodless 18-inch by 22-inch cut in that cow's belly. Dr. Altshuler received tissue samples from this mutilator's cut for microscopic examination. He found that the cut had been subjected to high heat, hot enough to cook the hemoglobin, as shown in the orange areas of this photomicrograph. In contrast, this is what normal cow tissue looks like. By February 1993, many more unusual animal deaths and strange moving lights had been reported in northeastern Alabama. Whoa! Somebody got a... How come it looks flat all of a sudden? Because you're zooming it in. One it's large light powerful. was the size of a car no, headlamp fine. above the house yeah, of Sue I mean, Leeds in Fort Payne. Her mother and a neighbor watched while Sue videotaped the object moving back and forth silently at treetop level. It looks sort of like that, Susan. It's sort of like a bow. Looks like, you know what it looks like in here now? Looks like the Batman emblem. That's what Susan said. The Batman effect was created because the zoom lens was not focused correctly, but something was moving above the house. Hey, it, it comes up real close and then it goes back. And I hadn't touched it. Is it moving? Yeah, to me it looked like it moved from from uh, up northward, you know, like it would go back maybe and then it would move, uh, you know, to the north. Because when we came out it was like there, and then when we came out again after I got my camcorder, it looks like I'm videotaping it through there, but then it looks like when it left it went that away, back, you know, out of my... Did it ever change side. colors or shape? No. Do you know, at least. Have you ever noticed before? No, sir. In the many times that you've backed down your driveway, have you ever noticed that particular light and uh, doing that particular maneuver that you have described to me before? No, sir. I haven't never seen anything like it anywhere in the sky. The same night Susan Eads videotaped in Fort Payne, a few miles to the southwest near Dawson, Alabama, several black and white time-lapse photographs of a moving light were made by Gary Coker, manager of a hardware store for 30 years and part-time sports photographer and writer for local newspapers. What happened while you were photographing that made you think that it was anything unusual? Uh, it had uh, some colored lights that you could see occasionally, like, almost like they were rotating around it. And uh, most of the time, the light would appear, the color lights would appear on, on either side or both sides of the bottom. Oh. But, but at times, there was color lights that you could see uh, at the top also. If while you were photographing, 
the light started moving straight towards you, what would you do? <laughs> well, actually that more or less happened the first time uh, in 89 when, when they were seeing it at Fife. It, uh, it was a lot closer to me than these photos were made of. These, uh, none of the time did I think that this was very close to me when I was making these pictures. But uh, probably uh, the first time, only five, six miles away from me. And it did start moving toward me, and my legs got pretty rubbery. I was, I was about ready to go. <laughs> what happened? Uh, the lights went out. Uh, as, as it began to pick up speed, it cut its lights off. Just, just went to complete just, darkness? Just went to complete darkness. And I, I didn't see it again for a week, and then I saw it again. Uh, my wife and I saw it again a week later, and that, that's the last time I saw that particular thing, although I have seen different things three or four times from that period of time till now. Well, when your legs started going rubbery, what was going on in your mind? <laughs> I was ready to run, get in the house, get my gun, <laughs> whatever, get away from it. <laughs> Why? Well, fear of the unknown. That's all I can, ex uh, only way I could explain it. I didn't, I didn't know what it was or what it was going to do. The day before in Arab, Alabama, Another calf was found dead and its rib bones had been cut off in clean, straight edges. In spite of the highly strange combination of moving lights, unidentified helicopters, and animals found dead with unusual cuts, DeKalb County law enforcement in Fort Payne insisted cattle mutilations were just not happening. Everything was attributed to natural predator attack. My video crew and I had been waiting for a call from local police about any new mutilations so that I could have professional medical tests done on a fresh animal. Finally, on February 25th, my last day in Alabama and after the video crew had gone home, I did learn about a new mutilation in Sylvania near Fort Payne. The farmer, Kenneth Hyland, told me that law officers and a local veterinarian had come and examined the cow and told him the coyotes or dogs had chewed off the udder. When Mr. Highland argued that a knife had cut the udder, the law officers told him to bury the cow and forget it. I explained to Mr. Highland that I was trying to get tissue samples from mutilated animals for medical study and asked him if he would dig up the cow that he had buried only hours before. I think because he was angry about the predator explanation, he agreed. By the time we got to the pasture, it was dark, snowing, and the temperature had dropped into the 20s. The only light we had was from the truck and flashlights, and the only camera we could find was a video camcorder the Weekly Post editor, Terry Baker, borrowed and operated for the first time. Do you think that law enforcement or people have been trying to cover this up? It's like a three-year-old kid could tell that was that way himself. But from your point of view, this was cut with a sharp instrument. I think so. And Mr. Highland was right. We cut two tissue samples from the mutilator's excision and sent them to Dr. John Altshuler in Denver. Microscopic examination confirmed the tissue was cut with a sharp instrument. That was the end of February, and law enforcement was busy for several more weeks checking on other mutilations and strange light reports. In Fife, Alabama, on April 7, 1993, the Fife Police Department held its first official press conference about animal mutilations. Media came from Alabama and surrounding states. Beginning in November of 1992, the Fife Police Department has been conducting an investigation into unexplained cattle mutilations. We've been doing this with cooperation of the local police departments and other law enforcement agencies. These reported incidents began on October 20th, 1992, and have continued through last week in Marshall and DeKalb counties. To date, over 30 animals have been discovered dead in pastures, with various internal and external organs missing. The incisions examined on these animals exhibit precise surgical cutting. In many of the cases, there has been evidence of extremely high heat on the tissue samples. <coughs> Dr. Jim Armstrong, Auburn Professor of Zoology and Wildlife Science, agrees with us. He states, quote, 
It would be obvious if a coyote had been tearing through. The wounds would not be similar to a smooth cut. Coyotes bite through and pull and tear away at the flesh. It would have a chewed on look. There are other scavenger animals such as vultures that will eat at the softer regions of a cow, but there's not going to be these clean surgical type cuts. There is no way a coyote or other predator inflicted those wounds. Can you speculate what type of high heat source would do that? Any idea? Did the, did the uh, universities give you any indication? Speculation and hypothesis are not part of our criminal investigation. Uh, we're not going to guess on what's happening. All we're going to do is base our conclusions on the evidence that we've gathered and from witness testimony. We don't know what the uh, source of the high heat is, but we certainly would like to know what's inflicting damage in excess of 300 degrees on the tissue of these animals. What do you think? I have no idea what's doing it to these animals, but I think we should find out. Is that, do you think that's possible to find out? If it's been going on for so long across the, the nation? If you look at the statistics, I think our chances of catching the perpetrator are going to be very difficult, but if we don't look, we'll never try. What would you tell people with this information? What would you tell farmers who are scared to report this? Now that this is out, what do you hope people walk away from here with? They can report their animals anonymously. We want to get the information about the case. We want tissue samples from the animals if it's a fresh kill. We want to take pictures of it. We want to have professional analysis done of any evidence that could be recovered from the scene. We want to help the farmer, but we can't do it unless he contacts his local law enforcement agency and requests that somebody come out and take a look at his animal. On June 16, the last reported Alabama mutilation in 1993 occurred at a farm in New Harmony. Round circles of tissue have been taken around each teat. The rectum was cored out and the cow's jaw tissue had been stripped. Local cattle farmer A.D. Hotchins told the Weekly Post newspaper, I couldn't have done that smooth a job with a razor blade. The Weekly Post in Rainsville, Alabama, near Fife, has been the local chronicle of strange events, and editor Carrie Baker is puzzled by the animal mutilations. In places where the cattle have been mutilated, there's not been any footprints, any tire marks. Uh, the lack of circumstantial evidence here, I think, is a, a bigger story than the circumstantial evidence. Uh, there's been a couple of cattle that have been mutilated after rainstorms. And there were no footprints and there were no tire marks left. Uh, I think it's more the lack of evidence here than it is the presence of evidence. You've been here through all of this phenomenon from 89 to 1993. What is your own personal perspective? The more open-minded people could be concerning whatever phenomena this is, uh, the more they would begin to understand that maybe we're not alone. And there's a possibility someone speculated that they were doing this, that there are entities from another world who are gradually presenting themselves to us. When the mutilations tapered off in Alabama, there was an upsurge in North and South Dakota. On Saturday, May 26, 1993, a three-month-old male calf was found in Harding County, South Dakota, with a perfectly circular removal of hide and tissue from the rectum and belly. An oval excision of jaw flesh and the right eye were removed, and the right ear had been excised and an oval cut with a darkened edge, suggesting the possibility that high heat had been used. Two horses were found mutilated in June 1993, one on June 12th was a male Palomino colt found near Independence, Minnesota, with its left eye removed along with a perfect circle of flesh. And two weeks later, Weld County, Colorado rancher Doris Williams found her favorite horse dead with its right ear and eye removed. An oval excision of jaw flesh was also cleanly taken along with the tongue. By July 1993, in southern England, three six-month-old calves were found with their rectums cored out tails cleanly cut off and ears excised. Horses were also being attacked in England and other parts of Europe. Horse and cattle mutilations in Minnesota provoke veterinarian Dr. Lyle Penner to say, something is not right here. Some of this is just not normal.
Other animal mysteries in 1993 included missing and mutilated cats in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, Plano, Texas, a suburb north of Dallas, Gulf Breeze, Florida, and Falls Church, Virginia, where more than 20 domestic house cats vanished between November and December. As 1993 ended and 1994 began, Animal mutilations were reported in Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, and again in Alabama. The Alabama animal showed evidence of high heat where the tissues had been cut. More half cats were reported to the Animal Control Office in Vancouver, Canada, and over 200 dogs vanished without signs of struggle from neighborhoods in North Georgia, east of Fife, Alabama. An increasing number of veterinarians have been helping research the phenomenon. In addition to the substantial physical evidence in all the animal bodies and confirmed medical abnormalities, there are also several eyewitness descriptions of non-human entities seen with animals that either disappear or are later found dead and mutilated. Even though eyewitness descriptions don't prove a link between animal mutilations and an alien life form interacting with our planet, I think it's important to consider what people report. Recently, I interviewed Oregon resident Dwayne Wright who met one rancher who described seeing glowing round disks pick up cattle. As this audio tape begins, Mr. Wright talks about standing next to a dead and mutilated cow at Sand Springs, southeast of Bend, Oregon, in the early 1980s. The animal was pressed into the ground as if it had fallen from considerable height. The elderly ranch hand, who has since passed away, told Dwayne Wright what he had seen and heard. Mr. Wright is speaking on the audio tape. He said they, they came at night, the cattle were just drawn up, they floated right up off the ground. He'd, he'd seen it happen, and he said that sometime later they just dropped them back when they were done with whatever. Uh, they were dropped back down either under the desert or through the trees into the forest. And he said you could hear them at night making horrendous crash through the trees. Animal bodies falling through trees into the ground after floating upward into the sky is difficult for most people to accept, especially when no one wants it to be true. However, people have been reporting incidents since at least the 1960s, which link discs and alien life forms to animal mutilations. I would now like to share with you a brief summary of some other eyewitness encounters, understanding that harder proof is still needed but the accumulating pattern of events deserves reporting. One night in 1975, a small being was standing at the gate entrance of a horse farm in Missouri. The owner, Carl Arnold, and his son could clearly see the entity in their car lights. That same year, Mr. Arnold saw a round silver disc in his horse pasture. After it was gone, the grass died in a perfect circle where the disc had been, and the soil became hard like ceramic. The Arnolds found five of their horses, including two 24-hour old foals, dead and mutilated with cuts they described as smooth as a hot knife through jello. On a July morning in 1983, Ron and Paula Watson of Mount Vernon, Missouri, saw this scene through binoculars in a field across from their farmhouse. I said, look, Paula, there's something back there. Look at this, look at this. And she took the binoculars and I, looked through them. I took them and I looked. And I saw this big black cow laying down with its mouth. And I said, my God, they got a cow. But what are they doing to it? And it was just laying there. And it had its eyes open. And its tongue was like hanging out a little bit, not real bad. But it just laid there and didn't move. And they just were running their fingers over it like that. And the, running them down it and looking at their fingers. The cone-shaped object was nearly invisible, they said, because the surface was like a mirror that reflected all the leaves, grass, and sky like perfect camouflage. The two small beings floated the black cow out of the pasture into the object, and then everything disappeared. The owner of the cow did confirm that one of his black cows was missing and never returned. In May 1973, Judy Doherty and her teenage daughter Cindy encountered a moving light and under separate hypnosis sessions each recalled seeing a brown and white calf rise in a pale yellow beam of light in her 1990 hypnosis session cindy said 
it's a calf about halfway up, mm -hmm. up in the air. And it's in this light and it's moving around. It's trying to get away or it's trying to get out. It's scared. Mm -hmm. I guess it's afraid it's going to drop. Cindy remembered that she had been lifted in the beam of light also and described non-human creatures who examined her. Cartoon bug characters is what they look like. Cindy could also recall a different being that resembled a snake. In what way? The pupils. They got the long, long pupil in them or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they looked. They looked just almost like a snake. Or like a lizard or something. I can see an animal being taken up in this. I can see it squirming and trying to get free. Cindy's mother, Judy Doherty, described the like same event 10 up. years earlier in a 1980 hypnosis session it's reported in my documentary, A Strange Harvest. Sort of chamber. Judy also described snake-eyed, gray-skinned creatures room. that she watched excise tissue from the calf's eyeball, tongue, and testicles and aboard what she thought was I a round craft. At watching how they excise parts. You see the animal being cut up? Yes. Mm -hmm. They have very large eyes. They're very hypnotic. Like, they're so big that and they don't blink. Their eyes do not blink. It's almost like, a, I guess, a snake. They were very snappy about their movements, and they knew exactly what they were doing. And I felt a little better because I, for some reason, they projected that it was necessary this be done. Why would something from out there keep taking parts from animals decade after decade? One woman in Missouri named Jean Robinson says she has encountered non-human entities who have communicated about animal mutilations. Here are some excerpts from her notes. We use substances from cows in an essential biochemical process for our survival. The material we use from cattle contains the correct amount of protein substances needed for biochemical absorption. While we respect all life, some sacrifices must be made for the preservation of other species. Continued sampling will increase as the need increases. Perhaps military and intelligence personnel in the United States and other countries have long known that an alien intelligence is responsible for the highly strange cases of bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. Perhaps officials are afraid of public panic and outrage if that fact were known. Perhaps that is why Air Force Office of Special Investigations agent Richard C. Doty told me on April 9, 1983 at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that documentary you did, A Strange Harvest, upset some people in Washington. They don't want animal mutilations and UFOs connected together in the public's mind. If the military or the federal government had been aware of this fact over a period of time and had failed to inform the people, then uh, I believe that the people would be just like myself. They would, uh, uh, they would be angry at the federal government and the military for withholding this information. I think the government knows a lot more than they're letting us know. And I think that they think that it would panic the people, um, have total chaos if the people knew what was going on. Why are they doing it? Why are they wasting these animals? Why are they making people lose money off of their livestock losses? I'd have to ask them why they were doing it. And isn't there some way they could do it without making people victims or the animals victims? And there's enough people that are not afraid of the truth that can bring it out, you know. If some kind of an alien life form were coming here mm -hmm. and mutilating animals, maybe abducting humans, what's the next step? I think that's why everybody is so afraid because they don't know what the next step is. So everybody's in denial. Sure, exactly. 
that's the easy way out. Denial. Denial. Because you don't have an answer. It's the unknown. So deny it, it'll go away. That's people's um, coping mechanism. But it doesn't go away. No, it doesn't. 